va a llegar el gol del Arsenal Ozil. Marca Mesut Ozil. Pasó con todo Bellerín, Christensen al piso, le llegó a Pepe que busca ángulo de disparo, lo vio Bameyang, cuidado con él y puede ser, y puede ser, y puede ser un golazo. ¡Gol! ¡Golazo del Arsenal! ¡Golazo de gol, Bameyang! This is Arscast Extra. Hello and welcome to another Arscast Extra, as always, with James from Gunner Blog. James, is it goodly morning when we're in the off season, in the, the downtime, this transfer period? We can't call it the summer because summer's nearly over. So, can we have a goodly morning? Is it a goodly I morning? How do so. you feel? Do you feel goodly? Uh, Let me ask you that. I just about feel goodly. We did win the cup. Let's not forget. Although that would be relatively easy to forget, given everything that's gone on since then. It's been quite a frantic period. Sure. But but I am on balance, goodly. I am too hot, Andrew. It is too hot in England. This country is not good at being hot. OK. Uh, I sadly have misplaced the world's tiniest violin to play for you because of... <laughs> because of that particular problem, too hot. We had a lovely day here in Dublin on, on Saturday. It was nice, but it wasn't anything like the temperatures you were getting. I was getting some WhatsApps from friends in London as well who were saying it's like 36, 37. That is too hot. It's quite good holiday weather. I accept that when you're living there and you're not used to those temperatures, that's pretty damn hot. So what did you do to keep cool at the weekend? I kept cool uh, in the way that any insane person would by attempting to build some flat pack furniture uh, in my living room which faces out onto the sun and doesn't yet have curtains so basically the windows acted as like a magnifying glass intensifying the sun onto my body so it was mm. it's purely it was completely idiotic of me right well there you go so you're a nice lovely lobster color this morning as we speak yes yeah. i am Uh, bright red. I'm as red as any Englishman you've ever seen in the Mediterranean. Oh my goodness! And I've seen some. I've seen some examples of that. <laughs> I have to say, in my time, uh, I suppose it's a cheap, uh, cheap sauna, though, in a way. That's true. Yeah. No, I'm not wasting any money on fake tan at this point. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm just a crust all over. But uh, generally, aside from that. I am well, thank you. Okay, good stuff. Good stuff. I painted a door. This weekend, did you? Mm. Now? now let's talk about this, Andrew. Okay, what sort of door was it? A front door, the front door okay. of the house, and also the side gate of the house. It's been needing a uh, a bit of a, a bit of a touch up for a, for a little while. I had a to new color. Yeah, new color. Didn't really work out as well as I would have liked, though. First, I had to scrape off some of the paint at the bottom, and paint scraping is a goddamn fucking pain in the arse mm. it really is and then a, a bit of sanding you know to to make it all smooth again but i got this kind of gray color it was a dark blue and i got this kind of dark gray color which i thought would be smart it's not quite as dark as it needs to be so it's just sort of in between now and right. it needs it needs more painting so i'm gonna have blue to do door. it again Well, the blue door is now grey. I put the undercoat on, put the paint, uh, the the new colour on, and it's just, it's not quite doing it for me. It's like a Puma away kit, you know, that way. It just yeah. doesn't work. Should be a red door, Andrew, surely. For, for Mr. Arseblog. Yeah. A red door with a white knocker. A white knocker. We don't have a knocker. We do have a portal, though, a kind of round portal. Oh, uh, like a boat. Yeah. It's got one of those little roundy windows in. Uh, so you can see who's can people outside. see in? No, it's that kind of, what would you call the glass? Squiggledy. Is that the technical mm, it's term? Got squig it's got squiggledy glass. It's got squiggledy glass. So you can't really see it. You didn't paint it. that, did you? No, no. My, my um, painting decorating skills are not quite as terrible as painting over the glass. So. Few, few. Uh, well, listen, I'm glad you got that done. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, I've got to do it all over again. We've had a big weekend. We sure have. Whew, we should take it easy now and just call call time on this particular podcast before we have to talk about any of the stuff. <laughs> How the can we, Andrew? This is the long-awaited hashtag Welcome Willian podcast. Oh, my God. You know, I've seen people blame us for this. 
But, but you know, we it's, get blamed it, for a lot of things. It, we do, we do. But it's not can't our take fault. It all to heart. No, you can't. <laughs> you got to <laughs> you got to take some distance with things like that. You know, otherwise you just you you go mad. You go mad. All the things I spend in the my world. I'm apologising, Andrew. <laughs> and I, and I have no time. Um, We're not apologising for Willian. It's not our fault. We didn't do it. It's like that scene. What's the what's the the is it Goodwill Hunting? It's not your fault. It's mm. not your fault, James. Thank it's you. Not your fault. I mean, he's not actually arrived, but he is Yet. imminent. Yes. I mean, he wrote his letter to the Chelsea fans yeah. yesterday. Um, I didn't read it. I'm sure it was full of trite bollocks. Yeah. yeah. I mean, look, it wasn't aimed at us, was it? It probably said things like, I had a nice time at Chelsea, which, frankly, none of us want to know. No, we don't care. Had a but nice it, time at Chelsea. Who remember cares? Baku. When we had so much fun in Baku. <laughs> oh, wasn't it nice in Baku when we played against that rubbish team? Yeah, Fuck and we off. beat them. We beat them yeah. so well. We all have such fond memories of Baku, our mm. favourite place that we always go together. Fuck off. Yeah. Um, We've all got Baku to the future tattoos <laughs> on our arms yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I have no need to ever read that stuff. No, I mean, how do you... Uh, look, it's one of those things, as you get a bit older, you can be a bit more sanguine about. But mm. I've always struggled with the idea of signing players from teams who you dislike. You know, I remember very clearly feeling sick to my stomach when we signed Sylvester from Manchester United. It was like, sure. how am I supposed to like this guy? You know, my, my default position when a new player comes to Arsenal is, you're an Arsenal player. I like you now. Maybe in time you'll prove not to be quite the player I thought you were going to be, and I'll have to reassess my opinion of you. But now, in the very short term, in the, in the moment, I like you, because all, all I'm seeing is the possibility, the potential for what you could be and what you could do in a red and white shirt and possibly an off-grey away Puma shirt if you ever go back to them. But when you bring in a, a Silvestre, when you bring in a Gallas, when you bring in a... Uh, that kind of a player. It's very difficult to find the warm feelings, if you know what I mean. And it's not like Willian is the biggest cunt that ever played for Chelsea. But, yeah. you know, he did Still spend seven years there and won the Europa League in Baku. You didn't even to Baku. You had such a nice time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, Baku forever. I. It's tricky, isn't it? Because, you know... You could say, what about Sol Campbell? Arrived from Spurs, our biggest rivals. I think it comes down to a bit how you get the player. So in that situation, they really didn't want to lose Sol mm. Campbell to Arsenal. You know, he came of his own volition at the end of his contract. But in a lot of these other instances, like Galas or particularly Sylvester, there's that part of you going, why are they, why are they letting him go to our team? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's that I'm, nagging thought of like, what's what's happening here? Yeah. Why this this shouldn't they shouldn't be letting their player join us? Is this a tra is this a trap? Is basically what you're thinking. Yeah, I mean the 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 other thing you're thinking is they couldn't care less where he goes, and therefore will sanction a move to someone who is nominally a rival because they don't feel like it's going to really improve that team. Well, the only thing you could say about William. And as you know, my brother supports Chelsea and I mm. had a, a long text message conversation with him to this effect, is that Chelsea did want to keep him. You know, they did make him an offer and they did want him to stay. But now, it, granted, mm. not for so many years as we have decided to offer him a contract the for. The six-year contract that we're giving him was just too, <laughs> too lucrative. Yeah, it's a six plus five. It's a six plus five, <laughs> six with an option on five at the end. Yeah. Yeah, look, it's good long-term management. We're we're maintaining his value throughout the course of his contract. Mm -hmm. You know, we're in, we'll be in a strong position to sell him in 2027. Uh, you know, we, we'll still have some years left on his contract. You know, in serious, yeah, they did. They gave him a contract offer, and he didn't want to take it. And I wonder, I wonder, is it more? I mean, I've seen the the, the stuff doing the rounds about how well he was very upset and disappointed with the offer that he got from 
from Chelsea because, you know, he really wanted to stay. But, you know, when they only, only make that kind of an offer, well, you have to really think about how the club sees you. Is this, do they really value you when they're only offering you £140,000 a week for two years? I mean, yeah. Or do or, they just know your date of birth? <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, is it a case that, well, he's very disappointed by that Chelsea offer, but fucking look at what Arsenal are going to give him. You know, it's it's that kind of thing. So, yeah, look, I'm I'm... I'm not hugely excited by by this one. Um, what but- we understand, by the way, for balance, what we understand <clears throat> mm-hmm. is that uh, the offer from Arsenal was not the most lucrative of yeah. the offers he had to take. Yeah, we understand that, do we? Where did that we come do. from? Where did you know? Where did that? I come can't from? explain how these things work, Andrew. It is a deep magic mm. that you wouldn't understand. It is very complex. Uh, it came to me in a dream. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to have to shut this window. What's happening out there? I'm going to... What do- the like fuck? A- I'm, I'm going to be like a dog left in a car. Right. I'll shut this window. Would be a good idea. slowly boil. One second. <laughs> I'm this doing is a-, a podcast, you- <laughs> God, don't they know I'm doing a podcast and it's hot? For goodness sake, you need to have words with your neighbours. They're always doing stuff. They are so busy. What is going on? Have a day off, guys. Yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah, so look, I, mean, I, I think, uh, you know, if it were me, and, I'm, you know, maybe I'm being cynical, um, I, I feel like the Arsenal's offer wasn't the best offer. It comes from the same kind of place as the David Luiz has taken a massive pay cut to sign another year for Arsenal's story, which I don't necessarily believe. Well, look, we're never going to know for sure, are we? We're never going to see no. that contract. But I think um, I, I, I'm really in two minds on Willian. Like, it's, it's, I know that's not the best place to be for a podcast, but on the one hand, I... Uh, feel like you wow that's a long three-year deal for a player who is how old is he 32 he turned 32 yesterday so happy birthday William uh I mean yeah so he will be nearly 35 at the end of that deal, yeah right? um I think that is a bit worrying and I and I have a sort of bigger concern about our general transfer activity if I was trying to be positive about it I would say that my conversation with uh, my brother made me feel a bit better about it because he was very very complimentary about Willian as a player yeah I, I I have to say that like if if you were to step back and look at it really objectively on an individual basis you would say he's 32 okay not great and you can't convince me giving a 32 year old a three year contract is a good idea but do I think Willian who I think is a good player could offer Arsenal something for next season absolutely in terms of what we've got in the squad um, some of the productivity I mean Gabriel Martinelli is going to be out until the new year Um, uh, Saka Nelson still very young we've got Pepe maybe Obama Yang is is going to move to the centre if Lacazette goes etc etc so you know, I can see the argument that as a player, he could potentially be quite useful um, for a period of time. You know, I, I, I think he is a good player. It's just the the 32-year-oldness, the length of the contract, the size of the contract, um, and, and us seeming as a club to do stuff that we're already in the mire with in terms of, you know, players that we can't get rid of because they're the wrong age, because they earn too much money, and because they were given contracts that were too long, you know? So there's yeah, that, there's that's that's my- a, yeah, it's like, should we care about that kind of stuff? Should we really care? Should we just worry about, like, what, what, what he can do for us on the pitch? At the same time, though, when your resources are limited, it's like you've got to be smart in the way that you use them. And I can see the other side of this as well, and a few people have mentioned that, you know, maybe it will be good for... Uh, some of the younger players in the team to have someone like Willian around to learn from, to to, to, to help their development. Uh, they don't have to play quite as much. We can sort of ease them in and out of action as and when we need them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there's not so much pressure on them. I get all that, but the flip side of it remains the same. Yeah, I think this is my thing. So if Willian was happening in isolation 
And Arsenal's other major sort of transfer decisions in this window seem to be revolving around signing players who were, you know, 23 or 24 at the sort of outset of their peak years. Then I think I'd feel a bit reassured. But if you look at sort of broadly at what Arsenal have done so far in this window, we've seen a lot of rumours about a a relatively long extension for Aubameyang, who admittedly is brilliant, but is Mm. a certain age. Willian, you're talking about three years for players already comfortably into his 30s. Um, You look at that, I mean, even Thomas Partey, who, you know, the club really are interested in, is kind of 27, I think, yeah, I think he's 27. So you sort of look at that and you think, this is sort of more of the same that we have seen from the club in the last five years where it feels like short-term bets, really. Mm. It feels like piling resource into players who don't have masses of residual value. Um, And that is troubling just because, you know, look at the financial situation the club is in. We're in a position where we're literally making redundancies. So it feels Mm. like, is that really... Look, I, I think Willian is a good player and in isolation, great. I think Aubameyang is obviously a brilliant player and in, and when he signs a new contract, I'll undoubtedly be really happy. Mm. But I'm just sort of looking at the broader strategy yeah. and it feels like gambling on next year sure. again. Again, and we've done it before and it hasn't quite worked out. You know, uh, we finished eighth. I know the FA Cup was amazing and I loved it as much as anybody, but we have to look at the reality of where we finished mm. in the Premier League last season and that was eighth, uh, which is in no small part to the strategy, recruitment strategy we undertook when we brought in players like Mkhitaryan, like Aubameyang, like Socrates. Um, and we have these issues that are still ongoing with certain contracts with Lacazette now two years out. The O's thing, which we'll come to later, unfortunately. Uh, Mustafi a year out, Socrates a year out, you know, and who's going to take them? uh, You know, are Mm. they going to take them? The one thing I would say, though, James, is that, you know, it is um, uh, the the window is only open a a week or so or or whatever it might be. We haven't actually brought anybody in yet. And I think, you know, if Willian comes in, uh, I think it's okay to have some concerns about that, particularly in the in the context of some of the other arrivals that we've had. And I'm sure we'll, we'll move on to that when it comes to our discussion about uh, scouting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if you know Willian comes in and he is augmented by uh, a number of signings who are more in the kind of age bracket, uh, which which seems mm. the right way for Arsenal mm. to go, you could you could make a stronger case for for his arrival. So I think you know we have to look at it. Um, we can look at it now, but maybe it looks a little bit differently at the end of the window if we've brought in some players who are 23, 24, 25, et cetera, et cetera, or maybe even a few uh, couple who might be a bit younger than that, and your squad is, is beginning to um, be built around players of that age with the other guys sort of providing a bit of leverage, a bit of experience, a bit of guidance, et cetera, et cetera, um, because you can't go too young, you can't go too callow without some measure of experience. As You know, we've we've lived that before. Yes, and, you know, that's one of the appeals of Willian, his experience, his track record. Um, yeah, I, I do completely buy that. I think it's about <clears throat> balance and um, hopefully we can arrive at mm. that. So look, last week um, after winning the FA Cup, everyone was feeling very good. And then there was um, the uh, announcement by the club uh, that 55 redundancies were going to be made. And, you know, it was a big discussion that I had on on the Arscast with Philippe. So I don't want to go over that whole discussion again, but I am curious to know what your thoughts were on that announcement um, and, and how it made you feel as an Arsenal fan. Oh, as an Arsenal fan, it made me feel really sad. I felt really, really sad for the people who lost their jobs. Um, I'm fully aware, as someone who works in sort of the media, that, you know, this is going to become more common in in many, across many industries. But, um, yeah, my first reaction was absolutely one of just being gutted for those people. And, you know, the the scouting changes are the ones that have sort of caught Mm. the headline, but they're... You know, there have been people who've lost jobs from uh, administrative roles, from box office, from roles in the academy, Mm. you know, uh, people who have very modest 
incomes, shall we say? You know, not not what you would anticipate of someone who works for a Premier League club who yeah. have families, and that's you know tough. It's a terrible time for that to happen to anybody. Yeah, um, you know, I think all of us in this particular financial climate can understand why. Um, job losses might occur at organisations mm-hmm. whose income and whose revenue has been badly hit. And Arsenal and football is certainly an industry which has been massively hit because of the lack of fans, the lack of ticket sales and all the associated revenue that comes with having people in grounds, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so objectively, you can you can understand why an organisation might want to streamline. I think, you know... I have a moral objection in some ways because of the wealth of our owner and because of the circumstances in which, uh, you know, people are losing their jobs Uh, and the the basic cost of what it might uh, take to keep those people in their jobs for another year to see how things pan out is is very Mm -hmm. small. So, you know, that's that's me. And other people will say that's business. Arsenal's not a charity. They have to streamline. They have to do this and the other. And look, I, I... can accept that other people have a different point of view like that on me. It just doesn't sit right with me personally that a club owned by a billionaire is, is behaving like this and, and, you know, to do it, um, to do it the way they did it. And that to me, um, I'm not saying it's the worst thing because clearly the worst thing is the, is the fact that people are losing their jobs and their livelihoods and they face this period of uncertainty and, and where they might get another job, et cetera, et cetera. And I feel really very sorry for, for all of those people because it's an awful thing and it's a, it's a, a scary thing at a terrible time to lose your job. But I think the, the, the framing of it, the timing of it, I think was appalling. I really think the timing of it was dreadful just three days after winning the FA Cup. And and um, I think it tied in with, with some membership renewals and things like that. Um, once they got the far side of that, I think, I think that was really bad. But I think the communication in general about, um, you know, how this was being implemented and why this was being implemented was really, really bad. You know, this idea of framing it that in order to keep investing in the team, we have to make these redundancies. It was yeah. playing on the heartstrings of, you know, of of fans, your club, a statement from your club, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it was something really dishonest. There's something genuinely, fundamentally dishonest about trying to say these people have to lose their jobs so we can keep investing in the team because the numbers make that an absolute lie. Mm, clearly, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, even if they save several million pounds, it's really not something that's going to make a massive difference to the transfer budget. Mm. Um, and not something that should, I don't think, make a massive difference to the transfer budget. I mean, I just don't think the priorities are quite right in this situation. And the hardest question you get asked about this is, why is this happening at Arsenal? And not anywhere else, you know, and that's where it becomes very difficult. Sure, to I mean it could be a, a, a question of yet, like it's not it happening anywhere be. yet. Yeah. And we are the maybe we're the trailblazers here. We're the first to introduce pay cuts for the squad. We're the first to let staff go. Um, you know, maybe we're just blazing a Is trail that here to for be the crowd. Co- no, it's absolutely know. not. No, it's not. It's you know, it, it's hard to take. It is hard to take, and it, you know this. This perception or this idea that we have that Arsenal as an institution behaves with with class and look, there's so much that Arsenal does that is great, you know, the, um, from the club, from the Arsenal Foundation, the way it operates within the community. There's so much that the club does that that doesn't get mentioned and doesn't get seen. That is really great. Um, but it's things like this, of, I think, have damaged the perception and damaged the reputation of, of Arsenal, the institution last week. I think it I yeah. think it was and I found that very disappointing. I mean this is tricky because not everyone will agree with what I'm about to say. But for me and this may sound a bit sentimental, I kind of want my team, my club if it is my club at all, um to in this situation like this look after its people first and foremost. And if that means you can't buy Willian, or even if it means you can't extend Pierre Aubameyang, I think that personally, I kind of sit on the fence, the side of the fence, which is more like you look after, you know, the people that constitute your club. Sure. Now, I, mean, I know not everyone will agree with that. I, I, I know what you mean, but I think, you know, 
the two things aren't mutually exclusive. If you can find the money to pay Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang 300 grand a week, which is what we're going to be paying him if he signs this new contract, if you can find the money to do that, you could find the money to protect those jobs if you really wanted to. Yeah, probably. Probably. No, unquestionably. Unquestionably. Like, yeah. if you've got that, the money to do that, if you've got the money to pay Willian a six, seven million pounds signing on fee and 120, 140 grand a week, you know, plus bonuses, plus whatever else, plus agents fees, plus intermediary fees, you know, and again, that's not being critical of him, but but if you can find the money to do that, you can find the two and a half, three million pounds, what, you know, to... To keep those people true, in their jobs, true. if you want, it's, you know, it's a false equivalency to say it's mm. mutually exclusive. But I, I still get the sense that, and I sort of was heading in this direction with talking about the way we're going about our transfer business. I don't know if it's being communicated to us, but I get the sense that Arsenal, from a business point of view, feel they absolutely have to be back in the Champions League, and essentially are making a calculation that. Willian can help us do that, but a guy who works in catering or wherever it might be mm. can't, and therefore that is the way in which all resource is being directed. I'm not sure. It's not. I don't feel comfortable with that, but that is, I think, how they must regard it. The dismantling, which is the only word I can use of the scouting network, uh, yeah. is something that you've covered. I just want to ask you uh, briefly about what. You know, the player reaction has been we read that they were very unhappy about these redundancies because they were told that if they took the pay cut, then jobs would be protected. Do you have any concerns that it might have an impact on squad morale or or anything like that? It's a tricky one. I mean, I know what you said about timing and it not being a good time. I guess in some respects for the club, in terms of the players, it is a good time because they're, they're all away. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they're not there. They're literally not there. So the communication that's happening between them about this is happening uh, and between them and the club is happening remotely. You know, it's not like they're walking into training and walking up to someone's office and, and banging on a door. It's just not possible at the moment. But c- clearly, um, and certainly there are several members of the squad at least who feel very, very disappointed by this course of action, who, who basically feel they took a pay cut to protect jobs. And, you know, it's difficult because we weren't in that meeting, but certainly people came out of that meeting feeling like that was an assurance that they had, mm. you know? And that's obviously gone, been gone back on. And I appreciate circumstances evolve, things change, but I think it is a concern. And I um, feel for the players, to be honest, because, you know, they went out on a limb by being the first team to take a pay cut. Um, against the wishes of their own PFA, and and yet you know one of the core reasons behind they did it has not sort of turned out to be true. Mm. I mean that's you know I would be pissed off too in that situation. Yes, I think anybody would. You know, leave aside the footballer's salary, put yourself in that exact same position in your own work, whatever it might be. And if you're told, look, if you take a pay cut you know, your mates in that department, we can save their jobs. And then a few months down the line, Mm. they get fired anyway, and you've still taken a pay cut. Uh, Yeah, you would be annoyed. You would be annoyed. And I think you would have to say that it's, um, at best, bad management, and at worst, utterly dishonest from your, your bosses, you know, the people at executive level who've sold you on this idea. Yeah, I mean, the the point about communication, I think, is a really interesting one in that I do think it's a sort of um, a slightly dishonest thing to suggest we need this money to invest in the team and a clear attempt to sort of get fans on board with something that's actually, you know, not particularly pleasant. Um, I also think it's interesting looking at the communication around uh, the scouting department, for example, you know, this idea of like redundancies, essentially these roles that are no longer required. Mm. And yet we've already seen since then as kind of more scouts have been let go, I think a bit of spin coming out saying, well, a- actually this is part of a broader audit. Do you know what I mean? And mm. it's like something that we, and, and I feel uncomfortable with that as well. It's like, well, what's going on here? Are these, you know, are these redundancies? Are you telling me we don't need these people? 
in these jobs within the company? Yeah. Or, you know, are you saying they're not good enough? I mean, it, it's just, it's a bit odd and it leaves a bit of a vacuum in terms of understanding all those decisions, really. Do, you do, I mean, on the scouting, do you feel like it's incumbent on the club to at least address the concerns that people might have? Because if you were to say, could Arsenal scouting improve? I think most people would say yes. But, sure. you know, it's not a it's not a science scouting. That's the other part of it. It, it is not a science. If you were to say, we are going to make improvements to our scouting network, nobody would have an issue, would they? But when you basically fire your head of scouting or head of international recruitment, whatever Francis Kajigao's uh, mm, title was, title. Yeah. Um, you hire your head of UK scouting, you hire one of your most senior UK scouts as well in Brian McDermott, who was former Reading manager, former Arsenal player, of course, and then you let go your head scouts in France, Germany, Spain, Italy, Portugal, um, Spain, I think I said Spain anyway, France, all over Europe. Mm -hmm. um, it It is a concern. Um, I've seen it suggested that this is because we want to move to a more data-led approach to our recruitment. But surely you can increase or, or use data more, but still require scouts on the ground because, uh, you know, you cannot reduce footballers to statistics and pie charts and numbers and whatever it might be. There is a human element to each player. And that's something you have to know and something that you have to understand. So let's say your data identifies a player somewhere uh, and he looks like he ticks all the various boxes mm. um, from a statistical slash performance point of view. And you use that and that alone to bring him into the club. But because you haven't got a scout, because you haven't done your due diligence, because you haven't done your background checks on this guy, because you haven't watched him on anything other than video, you don't understand the character. You don't understand what kind of a, a guy he is. And you can still do some of that uh, uh, investigation. But I think that part of the scout's role is a really, really important one. Yeah. I mean, I call bullshit on the data thing, to be honest with you. That, I, that smells like absolute bullshit to me because we had one of the most highly regarded uh, data and analytics guys in the world in Jason Rosenfeld, and he left Arsenal partly Le because he just left. wasn't involved. Left. Yeah. Left. Yeah, I mean, uh, look, uh, I don't think you can convince people that you're using a data-led model for recruitment when, and let's assume that Willian is going to sign for us, mm. four of your last five signings, I know people get annoyed at me or pissed off at me or bored of me going on about this, but when four of your last five signings have come from Kia Jarabchian and Arturo Canales, people, agents who are mates with Raul Senyehi and Edu. So we've got David Luiz... We've got Cedric Suarez, uh, Pablo Marie, who is a uh, client of Canales, Arturo Canales, Canales who is the, the Emery agent, and now Willian. And the other signing, the most recent signing, the one who's sort of the outlier in that, is Kieran Tierney. A great signing, but also somebody who the Arsenal scouting department identified years ago as a potential recruitment. Years yes. ago. Before like I played for the first team. I, I had heard about Arsenal's interest in Kieran Tierney maybe three, four years ago, perhaps even before that, that he was yeah. a player we'd identified how, not through data, not through agents' mates, but because we had scouts and somebody had looked at him and said, there is a good player with lots of potential. Um, so you can't convince anyone that you're using data to recruit players like Luis, Suarez, Willian, Maybe Pablo Marie, maybe, but, you know, the relationship there is convenient. And, and uh, you know, I hope Pablo Marie is going to be a really good player for us. I really do. We haven't seen enough yet, but, you know, let's not be uh, 
hoodwinked into thinking that his arrival at Arsenal was because statistically, or, you know, uh, the data told us that he was the best centre half we could get. Mm. I mean, yeah, I, I completely agree. And look, maybe the club will move more in that direction. I just don't think what happened with Jason and Stat DNA suggests that. And I think that. Um, oh, hello. hello. Um, I have lost completely what I was going to say. You were just talking, we were talking about data led recruitment and Jason Rosenfeld of Stat DNA um, oh, leaving. Oh, s- scouting. I was scouting. Just scouting. I mean,. The funny thing is, uh, some of the players Arsenal are targeting in this window, and I've written about this this morning on The Athletic, you know, ha- have been tracked for a long time by the scouting team. I mean, someone like Thomas Partey, since he first came through in Spain, you know, Kagegao has watched him, and the scouting network have filed reports on him and, and made a recommendation to sign him. Arsenal might go ahead and do that deal, which seems completely counterintuitive to the fact that you've just got rid of them all. I mean, it's really, really strange. And I know that the football environment is different right now and that, um, you know, scouts aren't travelling as much as they were. They're probably not getting to as many games as they were. So I can understand that at the moment it might feel like a, uh, you know, a slightly unnecessary cost because they're just not getting through the amount of work that they were. But nonetheless, you can't tell me that there's not a benefit to watching players in the flesh. Um you know, I have access to Y Scout, which is the so sort of, do I, yeah, yeah, right. So that's fine, but it only captures what the camera captures. It only captures what the player does on the ball or when the ball is within twenty yards of them, right? Mm. There's not you're not finding footage of how a defender holds his line, how he man marks when the ball's at the other end of the field. You know, things like that, spacing, all these things matter. And and Dick Law said to me once about a player. You know, data can tell you a lot about the neck down, but from the the neck up, the scout has to tell you everything. Well, and yeah. I, I think a, a good approach to transfers combines a fusion of all these different inputs. I'm not saying data's useless, and I'm not saying scouting is perfect. It's about combining those things. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Because and combining agents as well. You know, that can be a factor. It can be a factor, or, or not agents, but contacts and feasibility and how easy it is to get a deal done that is, that again can feed into a decision yeah. but i do think the healthiest pie chart in terms of how you do you run your recruitment has those at the very least evenly spaced you know for sure and you know what what y scout or any of these data uh, models won't tell you is like what what's the character of a guy like how does he train how is he on the training ground? What sort of a personality is he? And you can, you know, ask some questions and what have you. But, you know, I think it's one of the things that that, that scouts um, really, when a, a club is interested in a player, they do a lot of due diligence on the character of the, the, the guy that they're going to bring in. Because you can yeah. be as talented as you like, but if they look at him and say he could be real trouble or, you know, he's got issues with motivation or, you know, when the chips are down in a game, he's not the guy who's going to, you know, come through and and perform for you. Like all of those, uh, I don't know if you can call them soft factors, you know, they're, they're part and parcel of, of who a person is. And you have to understand what a, um, when you're making a signing, surely the best way is to, to know what, what their skill set is, to know what they're good at, to know what they're potentially um, able to get better at, but to know mm. what kind of a person they are and how they're going to fit in. And, uh, you know, are they are they a, a leader? Are they somebody who's good in the dressing room? You know, you don't have to be a, a leader. You know, can you just get on and do a job? Do you follow instructions? All of those things, which I think have to go hand in hand. And, and you're right to say that a combination of using all the information, all the technology, we have with the human element is surely the best way to do it and and we seem right now um to have dispensed with with one very important part of that and i think it's it's all right to be concerned about that and in six months time if we've put in place a whole new scouting network i'll hold my hands up and say well look you know you got it spot on you've improved things well done but right now when you're looking at it it feels a bit like a coup of some kind. Yeah, I mean, nobody, I think, is saying our scouting network has been perfect. No scouting network is, I would suggest, but it's an input. I mean, another aspect of it, and we'll come back to the point about the coup, but another aspect of it is, you know, you're talking about the personality of the players. A lot of these Arsenal scouts, they find ways to watch players in training. 
that's how far they'll go to kind mm. of understand the character. And it also, it's not like they just watch a player. A scout is often integral in the club's pursuit of a player. A scout is sometimes the first person a player will speak to to learn of the interest. Mm. Sometimes that scout, if it's a young player or, you know, any player, to be honest, may have to kind of befriend that player's family. They might have to win the camp round, convince them as a kind of delegate, really, for Arsenal, that Arsenal is the right place for them. Mm. And, I, you know, this is all the sort of shady world of transfers and how it actually operates, but the scouts play that role too. They're not just blokes with binoculars who just type some, you know, thoughts in at the end yeah, of the yeah, game. Yeah. Yeah. They are sort of the arm of the club in these countries. So to do away with that network, I think is really concerning. And, and, and coming off the back of you know, the Jason Rosenfeld thing and the stories that we have read and, frankly, that I've written about both analytics and scouting feeling somewhat um, alienated in terms of the the recruitment process at Arsenal in the last two years. I mean, at a certain point, something's staring you in the face, isn't it? Yeah. And I have to say, actually, what I find baffling is, and I'm sure there'll be people listening to this going, like, oh, why are you on the club's back? But I do find it kind of incredible how people are sort of so willing to just sort of swallow anything the club gives them. Like, I think it requires so little uh, thought to join these dots. I I wouldn't disagree. And I think you make a great point there about how it's not simply the scouting department that's feeling alienated or left out or marginalised within this process. It is also the analytics as well. So where where does that leave you? It leaves I mean, you I'm, with this famous phrase, you know, contact-led recruitment policy. Really, in, in 2020, is that the best way to do things? And again, you have to have relationships with people. Mm-hmm. It's good to have relationships with people. It's good to be able to get deals done. And sometimes it really works in your favor if, you know, um, if you can get something over the line because of your relationship with somebody. But if you're banking primarily on those relationships or on a small number of relationships to get transfers done, you're fishing in a very small pond when it comes to recruitment. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I found it interesting, the scouts that were kept on, you know, two guys in South America. Mm. Um, presumably, I think, because the access there in terms of video and in terms of data is so much worse. I mean, Gabriel Martinelli is a great example of a player you cannot find without scouts. And I know people will say, well, he had a trial at Man U or he was wanted by Barcelona. But ultimately, he was playing in the fourth tier of Brazilian football. That's a player you have to watch, you have to learn about, you have to build a relationship with. But Brazil is not exclusive in that regard. You know, Arsenal, this, this again plays into my sort of general concern about the direction of the club. I, I do think that in our position, there is a really strong case that Arsenal should be doing pretty much the opposite of what we're doing. We should be massively investing in data, massively investing in scouting, not buying players who are over 30, probably selling anyone who's about that age uh, and and trying to find the next generation of players so we can build effectively over the next five years rather than loading all our chips in next season again. And Mm. and and that nagging thought is slightly eaten at me sort of in this summer transfer window. Sure, sure. And I genuinely, I don't think we need to say any more about it. We'll wait and see what the window brings and people can make up their own minds on on what we do and how we do it. And I hope that, you know, come the end of the window, um, you know, some of the issues or some of the concerns that we have about the way players are being recruited might well have been um, uh, alleviated, perhaps. I hope that's the case. But, you know, looking at it right now, um, well, the, the weird thing is about being a scout, by the way, is that most scouts are kind of independent contractors, so consultants. Yeah. So they supply a load of work, you know, which is their reports, and that's all packaged together by the chief scout into a sort of dossier of, you know, this is our these are our recommendations for this transfer window. The club <laughs> do actually sort of own that at this point. So in a weird kind of way, the scout's job for this summer is kind of done. So it will be interesting to see how much that is applied in our thinking in this window. I think that will be fascinating. And and also, if it is, sort of what does that mean, mm. you know, having got rid of them all? I think it's a really, really interesting situation. And I, 
I also don't think you can make people redundant and then replace them because I think there's a kind of a quirk of employment law which suggests that in making them redundant, you're saying we don't require those roles. Yeah, maybe so, maybe it's maybe it's different for contractors um, and full time employees. Sure. You know, so it might well be a case that uh, you know they, they they can be replaced because of the nature of their their uh, employment contracts. And people yeah. out there with greater knowledge of employment law would be able to to tell us that one. So uh, perhaps perhaps that's the case. It it, it just felt a bit um, unceremonious, didn't it? You know, particularly when there'd been a lot of talk about. What Kajigao had done um, in finding someone like Gabriel Martinelli and, and the work that he'd done, and you see people like Cesc Fabregas, Nacho Monreal, you know, talking about mm. um, you know how grateful they are to him for for the work that he did in in advancing their careers. You know, in, in the case of Cesc, if people listen to the people listen to the the interview I did with him at the start of lockdown, he talked about how uh, his meeting with Kajigao was, uh, you know, he was surprised at how much he knew. He knew every single thing about him as a, as a young player. And that played a big part in his decision to, to join Arsenal. So, you know, yeah, it, it's actually been a really good year for, for Francis Kajigao in the, you know, I know there's hits and misses in any scouts track record, but you look at the team this season, Kieran Tierney came through that department, you know, Emmy Martinez, came through that department, Gabriel Martinelli. Uh, you know, there were quite a few sort of wins. Hector Bellerin, of course, is in the team. Quite a few wins for that particular department. So uh, in that respect, the timing is strange. Also, 24 years at Arsenal. I mean, quite incredible. Was with them as an academy kid and came back as a scout. I, I do see the other side of it, which is people will say... Well, he and his team were kind of remnants of the Wenger era and Edu is going to want his own people. You know, I, I understand that. And yeah, I good, can no, see- good job Edu has no connection with the Wenger era. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good point. <laughs> but uh, that is a very good point. But uh, yeah, I can see that there's an argument that people want their own people. I, I do get that. Mm. But, then, but then I also feel uncomfortable, to be honest, with wrapping those dismissals essentially up in this thing of it's covid do you see what i mean yeah 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 Yeah. that feels odd to me yeah yeah me too me too anyway look um it'll all come out in the wash i'm sure and we will see what uh what this summer well this transfer period um will bring because it goes on and on to be honest it's a long one it is we're going into october with this one so there's going to be plenty um, to sink our teeth into. Uh, and of course, if you are interested in transfers, we are doing specific transfer podcasts on our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash arsebog. If you fancy signing up, uh, you get those exclusive transfer podcasts once a week and we'll have one later in the week as well for that. For now, though, I think we'll take a break and we'll come back with your questions and more in part two right after this. Welcome back to the Arsecast Extra. This is part two of the show where we answer questions that you send to us on Twitter at Gunnarblog and at Arseblog on the Arseblog Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash the Arseblog and on the Arseblog Discord chat server, which you get access to if you're an Arseblog member on Patreon. I did it without fucking it up, James. Amazing. Well done. Thank you very much indeed. I've been practicing all weekend as I was painting the door. I was going, welcome back to the Arsecast Extra. This is part two. We answer the questions that you send to us on Twitter. And go about doing my lines like a seasoned pro. You know how that goes as a, you know, very impressed. A a treader of the boards yourself. (laughs) I'm always treading. I'm always treading on those boards. Tread carefully at the moment, James. You never know who Mm. you might upset and what you might get blamed for. True, true. (laughs) It is all my fault. (laughs) Do you want to go first or will I go first or? Uh, Have you got one lined up? If you have, feel Um... free to crack on. Okay, I do have one here, actually. Uh, it comes from Jay Gabs, Gabes, rather, Jay Gabes at Jay Gabes on Twitter, who says, Wilfred Zaha has once again, very publicly, been begging to join us in an Instagram video where he repeatedly pointed to a Zaha to Arsenal sign. 
conveniently yeah. placed at somewhere in a nightclub or something like that. I, I didn't really look into it too much. He says, do you think we could go back in for him this summer if Lacazette is sold to assemble a front three of Zaha, Oba and Pepe? I mean, I, just on that, I think it was, yeah, his mate did it as a prank in a nightclub is the story. It's a hustle oh, played along who with needs it. mates like that? I Jesus. know, I know. Well, you know, he's a big Arsenal fan, isn't he, Zaha? And he's obviously yeah. desperate to come. I mean, logically, I don't think it makes any real sense. Um, sort of completely subjectively, I would quite like to see Zaha play for Arsenal. I think it would be fun. But given my sort of broader points about the financial situation and the way this squad should be built, I don't think I can get on board with it. What, what about you? I can't see it. I just can't see it. Although we did have a suggestion here from Daniel Lane, who's at Dan Lane 91, who says, could a player exchange be on the cards here with Palace? Maybe Ainsley Maitland-Niles. Zaha has a great player who has that ability to win matches. I'm not quite sure about that. I mean, he's a good player, but I'm not sure uh, about that. But he says, you know, could he, uh, around other great players, he could really push on. Um, I just don't see having spent £72 million on Pepe last season, despite the fall, in, in transfer value or transfer prices, we kind of made our choice there, didn't we? And if we're bringing Willian in to play on the left, you would assume, um, you know, he's not going to play on the right, is he? Willian? He's not going to play on the right regularly, no. He'll probably play there, you know, sometimes when Pepe's left out. I mean, the only thing you could say about Zaha, uh, well, Willian, apparently Willian's preferred position is in the centre, like a kind of number 10 position, but he didn't play there much for Chelsea. Um, so Arsenal might be looking at him there. I don't know. We desperately need somebody. Mm. There. Zaha does at least play from the left predominantly. So, you know, Zaha and Pepe in the same team is not beyond the realms of possibility. I mean, I think it's mm. happened for Ivory Coast a few times. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't see it. I, and I actually, I, I, feel, I actually feel a bit sorry for Wilfred Zaha because... You know, he could have got a very good move for him last summer, but he was massively priced out of the market. And now I'm not sure. He had, he had a disappointing season, but in fairness to him, he didn't really want to be there. And I sort of don't know where he's going to go mm. at this point. It's very hard to say, isn't it? I mean, he's, he is still Palace's best player and most valuable asset, so they're going to want a decent chunk for him nonetheless. Um, I, wonder, I wonder, do Palace have regrets you know, in terms of what they could have got for him. But of course, you know, nobody could have foreseen uh, a worldwide pandemic coming. So the decisions they made then were, you know, what they felt were the right ones. But It wouldn't surprise me, actually, if he leaves England. I wonder if there might be something else for him elsewhere. But then, mm. have the other leagues got the money? Yeah. I mean, you know, a bit of unpredictability and flair in the final third and creativity, of course, would not go amiss in this Arsenal team. Um I'm just not sure that Zaha at the price that he'll that he'll fetch mm. is quite the right figure. Let me just continue on here because I mentioned Ainsley Maitland Niles and there were some yeah, stories yeah. about him during the week as well, how he has been told he is up for sale despite the fact that he's a player that Mikel Arteta wants to keep who Mikel Arteta likes, as was evidenced by his inclusion in the FA Cup final team. Uh, I think we said last week he didn't do that as a favour to Maitland-Niles. He did it because he felt he was the best player in the position um, for the team that he could pick to win an FA Cup final, a game which was you know so important for Arsenal. So it demonstrated a faith in, in Maitland-Niles. So you can understand why Arteta wants to keep him. But on the Discord, Andrew, the Hinkley Gooner, asks... Is there any truth in the board overruling Arteta in the potential sale of Maitland-Niles? If so, how concerning is that for you? Hadn't heard that rumour, have to say. Had you? Uh, well, just from the point of view that um, the, the stories that emerged said that even though he's a player Mikel Arteta likes and wants to keep, they still have him up for sale, which doesn't necessarily mean that he will go, but if the right offer comes in, they're willing to accept that and move him on. So so my understanding of the situation is that it comes predominantly from the player's side, that the player is open to a move. Um, and so consequently, if he, if he does want to go somewhere where he's sort of guaranteed first choice or whatever it might be, the club are receptive to 
that possibility. I don't I don't know anything about the the board overruling the manager or anything like that. I haven't heard anything to suggest that. Mm. Um I actually I have to hold my hands up to say at this exact point I don't know what's going to happen with Maitland Niles because certainly a few weeks ago he was absolutely headed for the exit. Um in fact when Arsenal signed Cedric the word from a couple of people inside the club was that that was kind of it for, for Maitland Niles that the door was sort of shut at that point. He's kind of forced it back open, I think, with some really excellent performances and an improved attitude and improved relationship with the manager. And I would like him to stay. I'd really, really like him to stay. But what if what if an offer of twenty five million pounds came in? <laughs> then you'd have to think about it. I think you'd have to think about it because you have got Bellerin, you have got Tierney on the other side. Saka. You know, you, yeah, Saka. You do probably still have Klasnach because I can't see him going anywhere. I think he's going to go. Do you? Mm-hmm. I'd enjoy that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Don't know where or for how much, but I think he'll go. That would be a, that would be a success, I think, for the executive committee if they can find a buyer for Klasnach. If uh, you got Cedric as well on the other side on the what, did we say it was a four plus ten contract, something like that. Yeah, yeah. So nineteen years. <laughs> so, so um, I, I think you'd have to consider it at, at that point. Yeah, I, I mean, ultimately, Arsenal are probably going to sell some players that Mikel Arteta might, in his ideal world, keep. Like, we'll come on to Lacazette potentially. I'm sure there might be a question about him. But if you said to me, Arteta, you can have Lacazette. And, you know, you can run his contract down and he can leave for free and you can use him for the next two years. I'm sure he'd be bang up for that. But if he wants new players or different players, some players have to be sold. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. There's got to be some players sold and some money brought in because I think there are going to be some some serious expenditures. You know, Aubameyang is going to sign a big contract and it's not just going to be a healthy wage rise. It's going to be a a fairly substantial signing on fee, bonus structure, all of those things. You know, let's not forget Mm. that that when when he arrived, he was paid a Champions League bonus for a year and a half, maybe two years, you know, uh, despite the fact that we weren't in the Champions League. So, mm-hmm. you know, this will be a heavily incentivized contract. The same with Willian. You know, his his nominal weekly wage might sound low, but I think when you factor into um, factor in the bonuses, when you factor in the signing on fee that's paid over the course of his contract, perhaps it's going to mean a fairly substantial outlay on that. There's still the, the Ozil situation. I have a question about that now in a minute's time. So, you know, there is going to be a need to bring in some money. I suppose it's just how that money is going to be spent and where it's going to be spent um, might make you think whether or not it's a good idea. You know, Maitland Niles, 25 million on paper. Yes, you, t- you take it. You take it. But... I'd rather I'd rather take fifteen million for Suarez, for Cedric, sure. than take twenty five million for Maitland Niles because one I of mean, them, one of them has the potential to develop and get better. The other is heading into the September of his career and is what he is right now. And basically, that was you know a player that Southampton didn't want. So I'm not saying that Cedric can't do a job for us, but if you're looking at squad building for the future there are decisions I might make differently. Oh, yeah. And emotionally, I'd much rather the Mail and Arsenal stay absolutely sure about that. I mean, you could say after that FA Cup final performance, his value is probably at its peak right now mm. in terms of where it, where it has been in the course of his career. So it's a little bit like the Emmy Martinez situation, isn't it? Where you've got a player there who's done really well. They're not sort of guaranteed first choice necessarily and this might be the most opportune moment to sell them um did you yeah. did you read the emmy martinez quotes at the weekend we had them on, I I on our blog news on twitter but i don't i didn't know about the source necessarily i wasn't uh, were they legitimate yeah 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 i mean he was talking to um an Argen, argentinian radio station so right. um i asked my daughter who's a fluent spanish speaker to do me a, a, a transcription of of what was said. Have you got them in front of you now? Um, I saw yeah. a tweet, basically, but I didn't see the... Basically, he's saying, look, I want to be... Uh, I want to play. 
Uh, he said, I showed the club that I can play, and when I return next season, I need to play more games. That's the only way I will stay at Arsenal. I, w- I want more, and I will not stop until I get what I want to consolidate my place with Arsenal and to reach the national team as number one. If I don't play for Arsenal, I would clearly move on. I'm not a conformist, and I always want to advance in my career. So wherever I play more games, I will go there. And I don't have any issue with that whatsoever. You know, um, he's got two years on his contract. He's 27 years of age. He hasn't played a huge amount in his career because of his status at Arsenal and some of the loan moves he's had, which haven't quite worked out. But mm. but having come through and played such a big part in, in ending the season on a high, how can anyone fault the ambition of, of a guy who just wants to play regular first-team football? He wants to do it at Arsenal. He's quite clear about that. But if he can't get it or doesn't get it at Arsenal, then he'll go. So that's the that's the the reality of his situation. Yeah, and I like his bullishness, to be honest. I mean, you know, and if you look back over the course of his career, he has always talked in those terms. We just didn't take him massively seriously until this season. Well, he didn't have the leverage, did he, or the the authority to really be taken seriously. Yeah. You know, look... Three or four months ago, it would be uh, a very small minority of people who would say Emmy Martinez has the ability to be Arsenal's number one goalkeeper. Mm-hmm. Now, mm-hmm. I would say that has changed. That a lot of people are looking at him, going, "Well, yeah, I, I feel very comfortable with him in goal. I also feel very comfortable with Bernd Leno in goal." And I don't think that would have been the case a few months ago. And, and obviously, what's happened in the last couple of months has opened doors or opened people's eyes to Emi Martinez and the talent that he has. And I, I suspect that if there's, you know, we are we are open to a measure of opportunism, aren't we? If we're a club that has announced to the world that in order to invest in our team, we need to make people redundant, it also tells other clubs that, you know, we're going to have to listen to offers that you make for our players. That's yeah. the two things go hand in hand. If you want to be taken at face value for the one thing, then the other thing is also true. Very true. I mean, on, on the subject of potential departures, Suhail Palmer on Twitter says, it was only last year we were singing the praises of Lucas Torreira. Why do you think he's now out of favour? And I suppose, as a secondary question, do you think he'll go? I suppose the, the, the obvious thing is that the manager is different from a year ago. Um, although I don't think Unai Emery was quite as invested in Lucas Torreira as as we were as fans. Mm. You know, was it, who was the player he wanted? Dif- Nzanzi. Was it Nzanzi or Fabinho, I think, was a player that he talked about, but, you know, realistically... Yeah, he, he wanted party as well last summer, apparently. But, right. Yeah. Um, you know, there were lots of players he, he liked the look of, I think, for that defensive midfield position, and Torreira uh, was not top of his list. That's for sure. No, I don't think he fit the physical profile that Emery likes in his team. Um, it's different now because he had the injury, because he was out of the team for a while, because also, you know, Danny Ceballos and Granit Xhaka formed a, a pretty decent partnership in, in the second or in this sort of last part of the season, you know. Um, it, you know, it's not perfect by any means. And midfield is an area in which we need to improve in a big way. But it, it felt like even with Genduzi out of the team and sidelined completely, it was still difficult for Torreira to, to get a look in. So he had some quotes as well, didn't he, about... Yeah, yeah. You know, his, Similar his, sort of quotes, really, about, you know, uh, I want to play more and maybe yeah. I'll have to leave kind of stuff. Yeah, the, 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 the classic, I'm not burning any bridges, but uh, somebody get me out of here kind of yeah. comments that we've seen from players down the years. And, you know, case or ass or ass, it's part and parcel of, of footballers and footballers' lives that these things happen. So it's no criticism of Lucas Torreira. If he feels perhaps more comfortable in Italy in Italian football, you know, it hasn't quite gone as well as we would have liked when he came in. You know, he, he, I think he won a lot of fans very quickly because of the way that he played and because he brought qualities to our midfield that, that we didn't have and had been looking for. Mm. I don't think he was helped by the way Emery used him. You know, he, he came in, did a lot of stuff really well, and then Emery kept using him in a position where he was asked to play a different role, you know? 
where he's been asked mm-hmm. to play higher up in the midfield to to do things that weren't really within his skill set. So I, I just don't think it's quite worked out for Torreira. I suspect that if the right offer comes in, that he will go. Yeah. Likewise. Do you want to know my bad Lucas Torreira opinion? That's so bad, I won't tweet it because I can't deal with the response. But I'll say it in the middle of a podcast. And hope nobody because, notices. And hope nobody notices. Because I, as much as I know it is a, one of the bad opinions that will people will tweet at me for years to come, I really f- quite firmly believe it to be true, uh, which is that I think Coquelin was better than Torreira. I really do. If you look at what their contribution to Arsenal was over their time when they were in the team, I honestly think Coquelin was better. Okay, it's your question. Uh, seriously, Andrew, I do not think that. I don't... I... <sighs> I, I don't. As think- far as I can see, they're essentially the same player. But Cockland, when he was in first, it, let's say his first two years in the Arsenal team, defensively he was a monster. He was like top of it, like so many uh, stats in terms of like tackles, interceptions. You know, he was he was pretty good actually. It's weird to me that he's remembered as a joke, and Torreira is this sort of great underappreciated. Didn't he have a similar kind of issue in the sense that having come in and done that defensive work and, and um, you know, that, that, that partnership with Cazorla at that time? And, I, you know, I think he was, for a period, he was good, Coquelin, no question, um, for the very reasons that, that you mentioned. But he was also pressed into action higher up the field yeah, yeah. by Same Arsene Wenger. To an extent. Same kind of thing. I think if you were I to mean, ask me who is the better footballer, I think it, it's Lucas Torreira, to be honest. I probably agree with technically that. Technically and, and what he might bring, but... Yeah. I agree with that, but I think in terms of, like... It's a really weird one, Torreira, because ostensibly it should have worked, but it just hasn't worked at all. Yeah. And, like, if he left, I, 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 I honestly don't think we'd even notice, which is harsh, but... He's been so absent this season. Yeah, I mean, and not I don't just think through injury. Yeah, I don't think it's entirely down to him, and I don't think he quite fits the profile that Mikel Arteta wants. Um, you know, he did for a time do what we wanted a midfielder to do at Arsenal, which was to sit and you know be aggressive and intercept and win tackles and and what have you. But for whatever reason, um, those qualities that he brought to the team were, were sort of waylaid by by playing him in a position which really didn't suit him. So, look, yeah, like I mean, you... If, if anyone's still listening to the podcast after <laughs> Cochrane, then I feel like I need to provide the context, which is that Torreira did those things for about three months. That, and that was it. Cochrane did it for like two years, which to me is a more substantial mm. uh, achievement. But um, yeah. anyway... I, I, I'm, I've always been a bit of a Torreira sceptic, so this is just my chance to keep the boot in as he's on the way out. OK, OK. Is it my question? Uh, I think it is. Arsenal should sign and Zonzi. That's my new opinion. <laughs> With Chris Samba as well? Listen, mate, I'd love to see Chris Samba back there. A giant of a man. Yeah. Um, it's your question, is it? My question, I think it is. Um, boom, boom, boom. Uh, Joel Fenton, at Joel Fenton 10, who said, with the Ozil story posted yesterday, would you support a partial subsidising of his wage in order to get him out of the club? And he said, by the way, I probably should have said move him on. Sounds like I hate Ozil in the tweet above, but I think we know what, what he means. <laughs> Yeah, I would, definitely. I said that already on here. I think Arsenal should make him an offer. And in fairness, I don't think they have. And they need to. They owe him money. They don't want him there. Give him a reason to go. Mm. Um, I know it might seem counterintuitive to give someone money to not play, but he is not going to play. Mikel Arteta... I don't think is going to... I don't see this one getting sorted out. I really don't. I think it's too much water under the bridge, isn't it? I know we go... There's all these redemption narratives, Sabayos, Maitland-Niles. This is like... He didn't play a minute in Project Restart. Mm. I can't see this one coming good. So, 
I mean, look, obviously it will now. I've said that, but yeah, you've got to give him a reason to go. And and and, and Arsenal are going as it stands. Arsenal are going to pay him, you know, fifteen million quid to not do anything. If they pay him ten to not do anything, they've won. They've won five million quid. That is the reality. I know. He it is... sounds awful, but that is the situation. Mm. Yeah, I mean, he he he's going to get paid. Arsenal have to pay him anyway. And maybe they don't have to pay things like his appearance fees and bonuses and, and achievement bonuses. And a lot of those are squad related rather than uh, individuals. So, um, but, you know, they're going to have to pay him his salary, whether he plays for us or not. Him not playing for us and being paid is absurd at this point. Mm. So even if we pay his full wages and he goes to play for somebody else, I think it's probably the right thing to do. The other thing to point out is that Ozil, Ozil won't lose here. So let's say he's owed, I don't know, 15 million by us. And we say, here's 10, please go away. He could get himself a contract, I don't know, where he earns six next season. And therefore, he's a million pound up overall on what he was going to get. I mean, it's quite easy to make this deal attractive to Ozil. Um, but I do think Arsenal have to do it. They've got to sit down with a big briefcase and say, here you go. Because I I am a bit uncomfortable with this idea that we're sort of trying to almost bully him out the door. Do you know mm. what I mean? I am uncomfortable with that. And I'm someone who, who would happily see him go. But you've got to offer him the money. You can't just make him ostracise him to the extent that he feels... He has to go for his yeah, yeah, yeah. sanity. He's not going to sit there and go, oh, God, I've had enough of this. Okay, then I'm going here. You know, rip up my contract. I am out of here, you guys. You, That's not going to happen. You did it. You made it so uncomfortable for me. Yeah. That In I'm fact, gonna... here's, all the, here's the last three years of money back. <laughs> Take that, you <laughs> I fuckers. feel so guilty. No, that's not going to happen. Of course. And, I, and also, you know, we talked about, is this an Arsenal way to do things about the redundancies? That don't feel very you know, classy. That doesn't feel very marble halls to me. About the, the sort of treatment of a player to make him so... Yeah, yeah no, I agree. I agree. Like, That's... Arsenal have to own the fact that they gave him that contract. Yeah. And they and they have to... They're going to have to stamp up. And it's going to be embarrassing. And it's going to be uncomfortable. But they fucked up. Mm. You know, and I know it wasn't these guys. I know it wasn't these guys, but some people were still there. The owners were there. You know, the yeah, board, yeah. essentially, most of them were still there. People signed off on this and uh, they, they got to pay up. And, and I do think that is the only outcome here. Like, I don't think, you know, I was looking at Unai Emery the other day, who signed Cochrane yesterday. The perfect marriage of Emery and Coquelin. What happened? Back together at Villarreal. Emery bought Coquelin for Villarreal. Get out of here. Really? I didn't see that. In fact, it's, do you know what? I mean, whatever you think of um, Coquelin, he bought Danny Parejo and Francis Coquelin, according to C- uh, Sid Lowe, for 13 million euros, which to me says, go and buy some players from La Liga. I mean, that well. that's... Not those guys, but... You know, it makes me think, is that a league that's under a bit of financial pressure? Well, certainly okay. Valencia are. Oh, yeah, of course. It's a fire sale, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Have they got anyone good? Uh, Parejo is probably their good, their best player, isn't it? Yeah, I saw... Um, was he Was he the captain? Um, yeah. I saw... Um, who, who's the kid that, that joined Man City, the, uh, Ferran Torres? Oh, yeah. Talking yeah, about Ferran how Torres. that Parejo guy was a bit of a, a knob. But maybe Ferran Torres is a bit of a knob. I don't know. Who have they got in their squad? Um, can dog be it? There you go. There you go. Can dog be it? At long last. Job done. Get, get Cochrane back as well. It's still not too late. <laughs> we can get him to rip up his contract with Villarreal. Um, well, I look. I hope he looks forward to playing as a number ten under Rune Emery. Mm. But um, yeah. So anyway, what we're talking about, Özil. Yeah, I. I think. I don't think this is gonna get fixed. And I think that when I was, I, was, I mentioned Emery because I think rowing back on Özil cost Emery so much credibility inside and outside the club. Mm. And I just don't. 
see Arteta making the same decision. I, I honestly don't. No, you can't. Because it just immediately undermines your authority. And he's got the authority. He went and won the cup without those players. Do you know yeah. what I mean? I, I just do not see uh, any other resolution here than that, that Mesut gets the vast majority of his money. Mm. Um, I mean, yeah. Do you think that's right? We, is that insane for a club to pay well, someone a load to, of money to, to not To go play? away? Well, I mean, it's insane to pay a guy who you're not playing. It's that's just, more. That's the thing. That's more insane. You know, it is. And facilitating a move somewhere else, assuming that Mesut Ozil wants to play football next season for anyone, um, which you have to assume that he does. He says he does, as in like his, you know, his site, his party, his camp say yeah. he does. His so if he wants play. to play football for somebody, the less mental thing for Arsenal to do would be to facilitate that financially because... They're going to have to pay him anyway. They might as well um, just just sort of lift the cloud, you know, that that's over us because of this situation. Um, and if they don't or if they can't, I would look at it as maybe a failure of of executive level management, to be honest. Um, that if they can't find some solution to this problem, this transfer period then I would have yeah they're not doing if United job. can get Alexis out on the money that he's on anything is possible genuinely yeah he's he got 450 grand or something in mental he like got that. a 9 million pound payoff apparently I think we're looking at something like that for us or but I mean I think we're looking at 10 million or something 450,000 by 52 is 23 million pounds a year jesus christ so they got away is, with jesus christ but so inter probably gave him a decent chunk too that's the thing and probably you know I mean? united are subsidizing his wages um and, and also you know uh he didn't cost them a fee so mm. it might slightly change the equation in their mind where they're sort of like well you know it's not like we have to recoup on that um Whereas, you know, Arsenal Arsenal have invested a vast amount of money in Mesut Ozil. You know, we must be coming on for £100 million at this point, more probably. Yeah. So, yeah, that, it, it's a really tricky one, but I agree. It is incumbent on the executives to find a solution, and I hope they do it in an upfront way. I hope they sit down with Mesut and say, this is the situation, the coach isn't going to pick you. Here's yeah. what we can do to make that happen. Rather than this sort of not particularly subtle, um, f- you know, shoving him out the door but without actually directly telling him that, you know? Mm. Yep, agree, agree. Just fucking sort it out. It's overdue at this point. Um, we mentioned, like I said earlier, an Alfie Cleghorn, yeah. who's at Cleggs underscore, has a question. He says, now that the, s- the season is finished, what are your views now looking at the Lacazette situation? With Aubameyang seemingly staying, is it time to trade up and move on? Or have you seen enough from him in the final weeks that he can be an effective member of the team going forward? Andrew, I'm getting really nervous about the saying Cochrane was better than Torreira thing. Well, I, I, my timeline's going to go insane, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I've ruined my own life. <laughs> I've ruined my own life on a podcast by trying to be contrary. Why did I do this? I so, I'm already all hot. I'm sweating now. That's what it is. You had the window. If the window was open and it was blowing the cool wind of rational thought through that Just room the, that you're in. Yeah. I know. Ever since the window closed, my brain has overheated. Just bear in mind, listeners, you're listening to a man under an, a, immense pressure at the moment. Who's ex- in, in, yeah. He's extremely hot. He's very, very moist. <laughs> he's very emotional. And, it, and you know he's prone to these outbursts. Just, <laughs> just remember, just be kind. Remember to be kind. Yeah, try and be a bit marble halls with yeah. me if you can. The we're, Arsenal way. We're all Arsenal fans here, folks. We're very we'll be, tolerant of the these Arsenal kind of with, mental health issues that can inflict podcasters. The, the, Thank the, you for yeah, your the, patience. The Arsenal family. The Arsenal family <laughs> will rally yeah, yeah. around you. My, our club, let's rally around me in this in this time of difficulty. A statement um, from your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> We've decided to make James redundant <laughs> after some of his recent opinions. Um, 
Okay, so what was uh, the question? It was about Lacazette. What's your opinion? You know, should we move on? Or can you see that he could be an effective member of the team based on the way he's played the last couple of weeks of the season? The hardest thing with Lacazette is I haven't got a clue what you could get for Lacazette. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's. I find it really difficult to put a transfer value on him right now. Mm. You know, it is, it could yeah. Be, it, it, uh, at the extremes, it could be under 20 million. Or you could get, like, 35, I think. Do you know what I mean? I, just, I can see it going kind of either way. I think my hunch is his best use is as a bargaining chip. Because I feel like you could get away with saying, we're actually including Lacazette in this swap deal and we value him at 30 million more than you would get away with someone turning up with 30 million cash for him. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. What do you think his market value is? Don't know. I mean, 29, two years left on his contract. Ordinarily, you would have thought maybe 30, 35. It's so difficult. I mean, we paid like, a lot, didn't we? We paid for Yeah, we plus. were going to take a bath for sure on on what we paid for him. But look, that's that's the way it goes. Um, a depreciating asset and all that kind of stuff. Um, like, I mean, I, I do laugh when I see people talking about forty million for Genduzi, and I'm going like, how? I'm mean, like, if Arsenal were going to pay forty million for Genduzi, you'd say this is insane. You've lost the fucking plot. So I think we, we have this. But you tendency. probably would have watched a YouTube compilation where he looked really good. Yeah. So you'd be like, "This is fine, actually." Yeah, look, uh, look, who's got who's got the seventy-two seconds to do something like that? But um, <laughs> look, I don't know what we get for like I said. I think it's it's decision time, though, one way or the other. We we either offer him a new deal, or mm. we we sell him and we move on. And I think at this point, to me, the sensible decision would be to sell him and move on because he's 29 I think we've seen this season that there is an element of physical decline already his knees are falling off yeah, yeah he's he's you know he's not going to get any younger we can't give him a new deal because he's going to be another 33 year old on big money that we can't well, shift you say we can't we <laughs> <laughs> you say that, Andrew. I do say that, yeah. We do love doing that. We do, indeed. Um, maybe that's just what we do. Maybe that's who we are. <laughs> but, you know, uh, ideally... I don't think there's a new contract for him. I, no. I really don't. I don't either. And I remember being Arteta being asked about him and being very non-committal. Do you know what I mean? In a way that he never was about Aubameyang, where he was like, well, he's doing fantastically well. We have to decide together, sort of thing, at the end of the season. Yeah. And I, at that point, I was like, ah... They know that's an asset. Maybe they could try to move. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I think so too. The issue for me is that if you sell him, I think you need to buy a striker. Well, I think if you sell him, I think you have to play Aubameyang through the middle. Yeah. Because I mean, that, that could be part of the Willian thinking in that he could play off the left-hand side and Aubameyang's through the middle and Pepe's on the right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, that that could be. And also, bear in mind, you've still got Saka, who can play from the left. You've got Martinelli. Yeah, you've got Martinelli when he comes back to fitness. Um, but your only backup for Aubameyang is Eddie Nketiah. Um, I agree. So I, agree I think, you have to buy. Yeah. So uh, just a sort of a very final question, um, carrying on from this one, it comes from Rocco, who's at Rocco0105 on Twitter. He said, if we look to someone like Edward who's the guy mm -hmm. at Celtic, to replace Lacazette and, and compare it to the Van Dyke deals. Are we Liverpool in the scenario ahead of the curve or are we Southampton keeping him until a bigger uh, club comes along in a few years? Fascinating one, Edouard. I think he looks like a really good player, actually. Yeah. Um, I did a bit of homework on him last week on Y Scout, watching bits and pieces, and oh yeah, that's yeah. that's the way to know everything about him, all right? That, now we no, no, now no you know. Now you know. There you go. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I do like the look of him. But do you know what's really interesting is that he's being linked with clubs at the bottom and the top of the Premier League. So I've seen him linked with Manchester United, but to today, this morning, scrolling through, I think he was linked with Brighton. And I think that tells you a bit about, A, people's general mistrust of Scottish football and what it, you know, what the level is like. But B, that he is in a kind of awkward position where he would be 
probably a starter for the majority of Premier League sides, but probably a squad player in the kind of top six area mm. at the moment. Because he's only like 22. But I think he's exactly the right kind of profile. Isn't that, um, what, we, isn't that what we need? Yeah. A squad player? I think it, yeah. we need someone who's going to develop over the next two to three years and, you know, potentially could be someone to kind of take the mantle on from Aubameyang. Um, and, you know, if you've got Martinelli and Ketia and maybe someone like Edouard... I think your bets are sort of quite nicely hedged there, you mm. know? Because we, we can look at those guys and say, well, Martinelli looks, you know, like a star in the making. There's good things about this. But we can't predict it, and we don't know what this injury is going to do to Martinelli. Mm. You know, we don't know how they'll develop. Um, but I agree, if Lacazette goes, and that's my understanding as well, that uh, Ars- I wrote that this morning, that Arsenal are looking at um, strikers if they sell. One and the one they would sell is Lacazette. Yeah, well, look, it wouldn't surprise me. It wouldn't surprise me if he was one of the guys who who left just simply because of the contractual situation and and everything else. It demands a decision because we cannot just sort of fudge along and have another situation where in a year's time Lacazette is thirty and he's got a year left on his contract and maybe we can sell him or maybe he's just quite happy to sit out sit it out. And I don't think, um, by the way, that Lacazette couldn't be useful for us next season. That's not the issue. I just think that if there is if there is a genuine um, commitment to squad rebuilding mm. in whatever fashion it takes. Uh, then he is a situation that we have to deal with two years out in his contract. That's what they said they were going to do. When when a player got to two years, you either renew or you move. So one or the other. And there's only one that seems realistic. Absolutely. And if you are going to do decisions like Willian or like Aubameyang, I think it means that when these opportunities come up, the Lacazettes, the Torreras... I think it makes it all the more necessary that you do take them. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Agree. Agree. Okay, well, look, it's going to be busy, I think, uh, over the coming weeks, of course, and we will uh, be doing our transfer roundups on Patreon. We'll also uh, keep the Friday Arsecast going as well. James, I think you need to go out, uh, get some fresh air, get a cool drink, try and try and lower your core temperature because it feels Please like... Please don't put this podcast out, Andrew. <laughs> Please just put... Drag it to the bin now <laughs> and let's never speak of it. I can't l- cope with the, the backlash. It's okay. If I thought it was bad when I criticised Ozil, then I'm about to enter a new world of pain. I think you've been very, very measured and very nice about Messit on this particular episode. So I know, because I, I realised how much I'd fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> I, had to, I had to claw back some credibility from somewhere. It's okay. Well, look, if there's anything we know from uh, online interactions, <laughs> it's that if the Mesut Ozil fans are on your side, you have got an army behind you. That's for sure. That's true. That's, That's for true. Sure, and, sure. And we know that people online, they love to sort of, you know, regard things with a sort of genteel disposition. Um, and I'm sure they'll just take kindly to my ramblings. I'm, I'm sure they will, as they always have done and always will. Uh, to those of you out there listening, thank you very much indeed. Um, we, we appreciate it a lot. Um, it feels like there's a lot going on at Arsenal right now, and as ever, we'll try and make yeah. sense of it. Oh, boy, yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll do our best to make sense of it uh, to the best of our abilities anyway. Uh, thanks for listening, subscribing, and we will catch you on the next one. Until then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.